challenges and how did he get to where you are now? Yeah, okay. Well, let's not make the whole 60 minutes um, about my journey because uh, you might need to set aside a couple of days for that. But um, yeah, I started with BHP in Melbourne as a commercial trainee way back in 1970. And uh, the beautiful part about that journey, unlike today, is that you were given to the company to work in all these different places before you found your place in life. Mm -hmm. So I was in mineral exploration during a mineral mining boom, which was very exciting. I was uh, in shipping and then in chartering ships and then international business. And then I was uh, posted to Papua New Guinea as the country's uh, or the region's uh, country manager at the age of 26. I was pretty happy wow. with that. Yeah, and so uh, I was just married then and we had little baby. Well, we had one and one on the way. <clears throat> and uh, so, you know, that was about, let's say that's four years of living in the Pacific Islands. So this is, remember, before mobile phones. So every, every order we got was by letter and every letter had to be sent to the steelworks in Australia to be <laughs> processed <laughs> into an order. <laughs> and um, yeah, so anyway, I came back from there, went to the Philippines for a period of time, uh, came back again to Australia. What were you doing asked, in the Philippines? Oh, same role, country manager, yep. <clears throat> The corporate BHP Billiton or BHP as it's known again now, and uh, then uh, back to Australia into national marketing manager roles, product manager roles, and then <clears throat> eventually uh, into state manager roles. So I had three state manager roles: Western Australia, New South Wales, Victoria. Um, and from there, where did I go? Well, I ended up becoming um, um, head of strategy for Blue Scope's uh, coated division. So it's a $3 billion division wow. uh, at some point in the journey. Um, and eventually <laughs> we parted ways after nearly 40 years. I consulted back to them for a while. University of Wollongong asked me in to uh, lecture in marketing at master's level there. So I did that. and. A few appearances at UNSW at, in, in their AGSM program. Um, and then, um, look, off and on from there, really, it's just been consulting and uh, board memberships. Oh, and I forgot just a brief seven years with a private family conglomerate, which we grew from 280 million to 450 million. Mm -hmm. just owned by the one family and um, mm -hmm. I went in as CMO and finished as managing director of running uh, six businesses in seven countries there and also CMO uh, mm -hmm. so that was a, a pretty you know if you want to talk about learning curves I'd say that was really a defining moment in my life you know at one end you're running this massive business and the other end we're trying to run businesses small businesses on a shoestring budget with no cash flow and poor systems and everything else. So there's a whole journey there we could talk about another time. But some of those experiences will come out today, I guess, in, in, in what we talk about. And if you could give yourself one advice, so throughout everything that you've achieved in such a little period of time that is so impressive, what advice would you give yourself? Um, um, although I had a lot of benefits of being moved around by a big corporate giant, it destroys your family, yeah. you know, cohort. You just, it's really difficult to manage all that, to be honest. So you, you, once you make a decision to get on the bus with a big corporate company, you can't be half on the bus and half off the bus, right? Yeah. So that's, a, that's one decision that you'd have to think through clearly again. But the other, the most important generic piece of advice is to always do what you love doing and do what you're good at. Yeah. If you stick to those two things, you won't go far wrong when you're building a business. Don't try and start a business that you're not interested in or you have no expertise in. Yeah. You can't have zero out of two. You might have one out of two, but you can't have zero out of two. Yeah. 
No. They're probably the two most important things. I know because everybody anyway. talks about the work-life balance and whenever anyone joins Academy Spinners and I'm like, say goodbye to your life. Everything's yeah. going to be the extreme. When you go on holidays, it's going to be the greatest holidays of your life. Yeah. But when you're well, working, you know. it's so goodbye to everything. Like It's like even your health. Like I was speaking to one of my doctors and he's just like, you can only do so much. You can't run 10 kilometers every day, be jet lagged and be doing three countries a week. You need to make a decision. So then I've uh, learned to like adapt. Yeah. But yeah, 100%. Yeah. Like it's yeah. oh, hard sorry. to play harder. And, and, you know, the last thing I suppose was that I was also um, deputy chair of the Australian Marketing Institute advisory board member for a, a few businesses. Mm -hmm. Currently, I'm chairman of Silver and Wise, which you can see on the screen there. Yeah. Which is, I received uh, the book. I'm so excited. Yeah, to oh, good, 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 good. Yeah, I will talk a little bit. About awesome. Really, what we're talking about today is the IP that's contained within that business, which we've brought into this government contract that we've won. So, yeah, it's it's quite an exciting. I'm really enjoying it. You know, I I didn't know whether I'd still be working at this stage of life, but you know, I have no intention of stopping. Um, yeah, but when you love what you do, you just shift. Yeah how you structure your day. Like I never want to stop yeah. and I want to dedicate, continue doing this, but maybe inside orphanages and charities around the world. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, we should yeah. never stop because yeah. we love too much and we've built too many connections and knowledge to just go and say, I think it'd be selfish for anyone to stop when they do yeah. what they love. Well, I'm, I'll apologize in advance for the background noise. There's two 12 year olds or 11 year old and a 12 year old in the house. And we just took them off their devices to make sure that we're all yeah, so they're, uh, they're not happy. <laughs> oh, tell them we're very grateful and then they can yeah. have the devices in an hour. Yeah, I'll send them your email address, Paula. That's it. No, no, keep the phone number. I'm a great babysitter. I've been babysitting. Everybody sends me the kids out. Oh. I'm like, turn on the camera, I speak to Aunt Paula. I'm Aunt Paula at the moment on for the last few weeks. Yeah. Okay, so Paula, do you want to introduce or are we already introduced? Um, let me just see who is here. I think, oh, wow, Denise here as well. Well, well, I'll start with a little introduction. Guys, we have the incredible honor of having Chris here with us. Chris has changed the world and he's just shared us a little bit about how he achieved what he has achieved. Everything is recorded on Facebook. So if you've missed the last few minutes, everything's live streamed. And he's put together, he's interviewed over 10,000 entrepreneurs and he's put together the biggest tips and divided them into eight categories. So today he's going to be sharing the eight categories. Everybody's on mute, but we do want to hear your voices and questions. So every section that he goes through, we're going to have a bit of a question and answer for you to make yeah. sure that you're, if you want to like spend some time organizing your question, you can write it down and we can read it. And we're going to try to answer all of them today. So we've got about an hour together with Chris today. So thank you so much, Chris, for sharing your Pleasure, knowledge. Paula. We're so excited. Yeah, so that's great. So excited. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm happy to be here. Um, I just, the only caveat, there's no legal or financial advice that I'm giving anyone today. All yeah. right. So, you know, take, take anything I say and test it yourself. Yeah. Um, look, I always sort of like to, I didn't get a chance because you, you, you got in ahead of my, my um, sort of next slide, which is the who am I bit. But, you know, it's really not about who I am. It's more about what experiences I've had. Um, mm -hmm. You know, every day I wake up to a new experience or a new learning. And hasn't this crazy virus thing taught us that everything that we knew before, hey, we'd better start learning again because yeah. the whole world's just changed and there are winners, there are losers. But whatever it is, it's the new normal. Yeah, um, yeah and, and I guess we've got a fairly heavy Latin uh, audience here, possibly with the exception of Chris that I can see on my screen, Chris Gold. Um, but, you know, I've married a, a beautiful Colombian uh, girl, so uh, she's also been on the journey that most of you younger guys um, have been on. She came from uh, Bogota, went to Melbourne University to do her master's there. And, you know, it's taken her 20 years to integrate into the way of life here and to, to build her own career. So I do understand something of that journey. So let's get on, guys. What are we doing here? Well, at the end of the day, 
all we're trying to do is to successfully bin, uh, build and win a profitable business. There's no real other major cause here. If you're an entrepreneur, unless you're a real not-for-profit, but even then, of course, you need to be profitable so that you can distribute those profits to the cause that you're targeting. So it's a simple objective, isn't it? Um, and I'm not going to read all that out, but you know, we're a country of small businesses, which, of course, right now is why the country is suffering so much. You know, small businesses don't have deep pockets, they have no reservoir of cash, they have no backup plan, pretty much exclusively. If they're still in a service or a product niche that's got demand, they're still in business. If they haven't, they're not in business. It's pretty simple. So we know that, um, you know, in a way, the ground has been leveled for people wanting to enter the market now. So what does success depend on? Well, you know, knowing your market, your customers, your competition, but, you know, more importantly, it's about delivering value. It isn't some sort of empty, hey, I want to make this, I want to sell that, I want to service this. It's going to take all of your knowledge, skills, competence, organisational ability, and as you said earlier, Paula, you know, it's a 24-7 job initially to build and deliver value to your clients. It's not about luck. There's, there's virtually no luck in this. The harder you work, the luckier you'll get. Um, I've just got a few notes. I'm going to keep flicking pages. <clears throat> um, so there's a couple of things you kind of need to know as you go through this journey. Probably the most important thing is, is to know yourself. And you'll see the bottom point on that slide, which is, I think, probably one of the most important things. Paul, you asked me before, what's the piece of advice I would give people? And the most important piece of advice, as I said, is to do what you enjoy doing and do what you're good at in order to find your why. If you don't establish your why at the beginning of this journey, you will have very many unhappy days because you have no platform, no base on which everything else will be compared to or judged against. Okay? If someone says, do you like that car? Would you like that car? What are you comparing it to? No car, a horse, a sheep, a donkey? I don't know. I, I run into people every day of the week who tell me their business ideas and, and they're just exuberant about their business idea, but they really struggle to, to keep it contained or confined or focused. And they've got uncles, aunties, mothers, cousins, brothers, sisters, children, all giving them advice every day of the week. And they're giving them advice because it's obviously unclear to everybody, including the entrepreneur, what the hell they're trying to do. <laughs> so, so important to define your why. And it doesn't matter if your why changes over time. It doesn't matter if it changes after one year if you're not happy. But the thing is, if you have a base, a solid platform, you can then, when people come to you and say, have you thought of this? There's two answers. One is, yes, I have. It's not what I want to do. Thank you for the thought. Um, it's not part of my plan. Or, hey, that's worth thinking about. Let's put it into the next planning cycle and we'll evaluate it. But right now, this is my plan. It's not, hey, anything's good enough, okay? It isn't. So uh, the other thing, of course, we need to know about is customers and markets. You know, uh, who are our customers? Where are they? And I see the notes say, where do they live? But, you know, maybe that's important. Maybe it's not. Um, um, what do they want? And most importantly, how do we know what they want? Now, we're going to talk about this in more detail. So I'll probably save myself a few extra words at that point. And just so, so here we get to the beginning of this journey, eight steps to running a better business. Now, these eight steps, these eight steps aren't randomly compiled by Chris. 
This is based, as Paul said, on the um, evidence that we've gained from 10,000 business owners that we've serviced over about 20 years. And it's not just me, it's my very, very fantastic business partner, Hunter Leonard, who's the founder of Silver and Wise. And his books, not just this one, there's a couple of others as well, which is the um, Get Your Marketing Cooking book. And uh, he he's had quantitative research. So again, it's not qualitative, it's quantitative. And it's been a consistent compendium of questions that's gone over 20 years to 10,000 business owners. And our view is that if you have any other question, it's contained within those eight, okay? These are the eight core foundation sort of things that you need to be competent in to be successful in business. And of course, you can see some of them, you can go pretty deep. So we won't go in depth on all of those today. We'll focus around, you know, the strategy bit, marketing, the sales, a little bit of money, a uh, little bit of quality and customer service or client service. Um, now, probably the most important slide of all, as we talked about, is this sort of strategy and leadership or planning piece, which is at the front end. Um, so again, let's just re-emphasize the importance of having that why, okay? Because it's okay to say, I'm doing this to make money in three years time, sell a business, make some money and get out. Not a problem. Uh, it's okay to say, I'm doing this because I want to build a legacy for children I don't even have yet. That's okay too. It doesn't matter what your why is, as long as you're true to that cause, because it will guide you in every decision you make. Example, recently, <clears throat> I had a, a young guy who runs, I don't want to mention the company's name, He's a terrific young guy and he's trying to build a business that supplies restaurants with vinegar. Well, he's already done that. And guess what's happened to the restaurant trade, right? It's pretty stuffed. So um, he rang me very excited and said, he's pivoting the business. I said, well, that's great. What are you doing? Hand sanitizer. I said, okay, but you know, guys, <laughs> just remember, hand sanitizer was desperately needed about four weeks ago, six weeks ago, you know, <laughs> have you missed the bus? But, you know, the answer to me here isn't that it's necessarily a bad idea. It could be a good idea, but it's not or, it's and, okay? So here's my original mission, my why, what I want to do, what I'm trying to get to. I said, you must not park that, leave it, abandon it, walk away from it or anything like that. You run that business with all the energy you've got and adapt to today's market, full stop. Now, there's this other piece which says hand sanitizer, which you will run a business case on. You'll judge it on its, on its merits for its potential to make money. And then we got into a whole discussion about pricing. Uh, you know, because people's first inclination, if you like, is to be low price. And, you know, low price to me is not the name of the game. It's about value for the customer, right? So if you've got low price and if you've got high quality and low price, you've got a real problem because you've probably got high cost as well. So, you know, focus on value delivery and focus on making margin. Anyway, that's digressing a little bit. So anyway, if you haven't got a plan, you're basically on a boat without a map. And that's not a good place to be. You don't want to be there. All right, so let's just go and have a look at a couple of, uh, and I don't want to sort of get too academic here, <clears throat> but you know, here's a, you can read this later. Here's a little definition of strategy. You know, it's, it's a systematic plan of activity designed to achieve a particular goal or goals, right? It doesn't, deal with the what, it just deals with the how. It's inclusive of the purpose and direction, okay? But why do we have it? Because it's, it's about getting control over our destiny, right? When we wake up each day, we should know what we're trying to do. Where are we going? What's on, you know, what are we doing this month? What are we doing this quarter? It isn't, hey, I'll wait till the phone rings and I'll see what the priority is. No, it isn't that. But a lot of people run their lives that way. I would say of the 300, or actually, it's 
probably closer to 400 people in the last 12 months that I've spoken to, only one person came with a business plan. Okay, one person. Now, to some extent, that reflects the kind of program that I'm dealing with. I'm dealing with people who have never owned a business, run a business. Typically, they're starting. But even when I do run into people who've got a business, they nearly always say to me, oh, I know I need one, but I just didn't want to do it. Yeah, nobody likes doing them. I haven't met too many people who love doing them, but you'd better have one because otherwise, when the phone rings, you're subject to all the random forces of that phone call, anything that hits your ears that day. <clears throat> um, vision, you really is describing the future state. So, you know, where do I want to be? This can boil down into a quite a personal thing. You know, this is a bit corporate, isn't it? But, you know, you can make that more personal. Um, I'll, I'll take some questions maybe when we get through the marketing piece, because it's pretty closely linked. Unless anyone's got anything burning now. Paula, do you want to just check if people have got anything burning at this point? I think is that what we were talking about having a plan and having a direction. Um, we had the CMO of Huawei um, coming in to present at Academy of Entrepreneurs. And it was very interesting because he was like, oh, so like, a, like an incredible leader. Like everything he touched turned into gold when he was working for the corporate world. And then he came to present at Academy of Venice, and this was the beginning of his entrepreneurial journey. And he shared with us and he said, the hard thing about being your own boss is that you don't have a boss. So you don't have it. It's not like you wake up and you know, you need to hit a certain target. And he's just like, I don't know what to focus on. And he's incredible. He's very well connected, but he's just like, I don't know how to divide my day. And eventually he decided to do consulting because he was really good at giving advice, but he didn't want to run his own business. And I thought that was very smart because we need to divide. And what I always encourage the students at Academy of Venice is understand the flow of the business. And then allocate two hours a day for marketing, two hour days, another day for HR, for operation. So it's kind of like they report into them and they spend a few minutes or hours every week working on a part of their business that can't be forgotten because we get so stuck between phone call, emails, or especially in the beginning of the business, saying yes to everything because we want to grab every opportunity. And then you lose your mission, vision, and even values because you kind of like think that being flexible is giving you more opportunities. And before you know, you're no one in the market because you're not a specialist in anything and you don't have a target audience anymore. So no, very good. Does anyone want to say anything else or any questions so far? No? Cool, well, okay. email, You know, email and social media don't substitute for good planning. Yeah. Because the temptation is we'll always fall back and think that doing emails is business. It isn't yeah. doing business. Mm -hmm. Building relationships is doing business. Yeah. Social media may or may not be part of building your business. Yeah. But in its own right, it isn't about sitting there on LinkedIn or sitting there on, you know, yeah. any of the other platforms. But okay. A <clears> little tip <throat> if you guys want to implement a little tip that I've done is I do emails early in the morning and late in the afternoons so after work hours because I realized that I was getting so many messages. I'm like, I'm not being productive at all, especially when I was able to go out. But now during the day, I'm using that time to speak and be creative and emails, not in work hours because they just swallow your whole day. Yeah, no, that's good advice. I love that advice. Yeah, and I've, you know, I've worked for some very, you can imagine, some very powerful and successful people. And some of them, you know, you could send 50 emails to some of them and they wouldn't respond to one. You know why? Because not one of those 50 emails was anything they cared about, right? It's not what they're being asked to focus on. So stop wasting your time and just find out what it is they want, you know? Okay, so really important message for today, guys. Any new business, anything we're doing today, it's not about the virus, okay? Stop talking about the virus. Customers don't want to hear about it anymore. They just want to know the how, when, and where they're going to get your product or service. They want to know the benefits that are going to come from dealing with you. They want to know that you're going to meet a need. Um, you know, what problem it solves. Is it solve a problem of convenience? Now, I've wrote those in today because convenience, lead time, quality, you know, they're critical things today. Before, I could just jump in the car, go and talk to somebody, get them round. But, but now I've got to kind of do things a bit differently, don't I? So we all need to be sensing how we're going to be putting our, developing our value proposition for our clients. But it isn't about the bloody virus. This is the new norm for a long time. 
there are some things out of this current period of craziness that are not going to go away ever. They're going to stay. Some things out of this period of history will remain and change us forever. Other things will come back and return. There are winners and there are some losers. But imagine, I just wrote a note earlier, you know, imagine if you landed on Earth today, you never knew about what was yesterday and all you saw was today, right? So all you knew was what you saw. So what businesses would you build and how would you service customers and make money if you only saw the world and you arrived yesterday? What would you do, okay? Let's not throw our mind and cast ourselves back into the past. We draw on experiences from the past, but we're in the, we're in the current and we're looking to the future and trying to anticipate, you know, what customers are looking for. So part of marketing and managing your image is really about you know, image reputation, but understanding and developing a value proposition. Now, luckily I'm old enough to have worked with the two guys that monetized the word value proposition. Guys called Michael Lanning and uh, Phillips, can't remember his first name, but I'm still connected with Michael Lanning. A couple of you know, Ivy League university guys from East Coast, USA. And it, it isn't just a throwaway couple of words. It's a big piece of work to develop value propositions, understanding your customer, your market. And even today, I still run into people who still haven't even segmented their market. They still haven't even uh, understood what, you know, which segments they're trying to service. So basic things like that. Uh, planning, testing, measuring your marketing. Now we use a little model, not just in Silver and Wise, but in our other little business called Blue Frog Marketing called Rapid, which is research, analyze, plan, implement, and detect. Now research is exactly what it says. You don't start any new business until you've done some market research, okay? Your intuition is a really poor place <laughs> to start a business from or to rely on. It usually doesn't work because our frame of reference is so narrow. We're one, one in 25 million in Australia. And if you want to take a global view, of course, it's even more miserable. And, you know, again, everybody that comes to me talks to me with such energy and passion about their business idea, which is fantastic. And my first question is, what market research have you done? And, and it's followed by the why question. But, but the first question is what market research? And the answer is nearly always zero. A couple of people have done bits and pieces. But, you know, um, again, you don't, it doesn't have to be expensive. You know, survey monkeys there, Google have survey platforms. It, it's not difficult to undertake some targeted and, and structured market research, at least to give you a frame of reference for what people are looking for, how much they might pay for something. What are, and, and you're really looking for these key insights, right? We're not just looking for seven out of 10 people want this. We're looking for key insights, things that will make a difference and, and help your business stand out over competitors. Now, the other things on there, uh, bits that might come a bit later, capability statements, data sheets, these are, all, these are all evidentiary pieces. These are pieces which attach to your business once you're established and people go to your website and they say, oh, okay, they've got capability statement, they've got data sheets, wow, these guys, you know, they know something, they're doing something good here. And it's, it's a stamp of authenticity, isn't it? And, and strength that you've got those, you've taken the trouble and the care to think about people. Um, the branding, <clears throat> well, um, I can't remember if I've got another slide on that, so I'll cover it now. Um, the branding piece is really, from my point of view, at this early stage, if we're talking about startups, talking about just getting trademark protection or business name protection, preferably trademark protection. Now, why is that important? Well, if you haven't got trademark protection for either your business name or your product name, 
then when, when you sell the business, you are not maximizing the potential value of that business, okay? There's a saying, revenue follows assets. Revenue follows assets, don't forget it. Now, assets are capability statements, data sheets, websites, brochures, trademarks, okay? There's lots of things, their customers, their products, they're everything, but when you sell, I, I sold a business for that um, private business that I worked for. I sold an agricultural business and they had to pay an extra $200,000 to get the trademark. Okay. On a business that wasn't worth much because it had been losing cash for years, but they wanted the trademark. The trademark was, was iconic in the agricultural business. We've got another, actually it was more than 200, but less than 300, yeah. So <clears throat> there's lots of lessons. And, and in fact, in fact, I, um, we ran a business which towed tractors at the, uh, tractors that tow aircraft uh, at Sydney Airport. All over, we sold them to 45 countries all over the world uh, under the name of Bliss Fox, right? Which was a iconic uh, mining industry brand, industrial brand name uh, all over the world but mostly here in Australia. And we didn't own the trademark. The owner of our business, you know, just this private high wealth individual had bought the business and hadn't worried about getting the trademark. And the trademark was the value of the business. So some dude sitting in a house in Seven Hills owned the trademark. He had nothing to do with tractors, didn't know anything. But guess what? He let it lapse. I grabbed it, right? Have a guess what that was worth? A lot of money. Okay, uh, testimonials. Well, <clears throat> I'd, I'd sort of put testimonials probably a bit in the same category as having networks. It's not on that list, it should be on that list. Networks are absolutely, you know, there's nothing you can do to get, you can't afford to be on the first page of Google search engine, right? Very few people can afford that. And it's not really the key to success. The key to success is about building networks. I mean, you know, I'm sure, Paula, you've got thousands. You know, I've got a few thousand. I'm sure other people have got, the hunter's got more than 10,000. Um, you know, this is how you reach people. You reach people through all of the things that are on that page, but you, you're really talking to your network and getting them to come to you because they love your product, they love your service, they've heard about you. But behind all this, <clears throat> of course, is this little thing called a value proposition. <clears throat> I'm not gonna dwell on this, <clears throat> excuse me. But here's a little canvas, which just shows some of the factors that you'd wanna take into account. As I say, it is a long process to get it right. I've run workshops that have gone literally for a week, you know, long days for a week, just to build a value proposition for one market segment. So color bond fencing was the example. But, you know, benefits, features, well, features are relatively unimportant. Benefits are very important. Um, but in the end, you know, a value proposition um, identifies customer benefits. It links the benefits to the value you're offering. It helps you differentiate and position yourself. <clears throat> These are just some of my slides I threw in tonight because I thought, you know, it might be quite, quite useful just to think a bit more because it's a bit of a throwaway tagline, the old value proposition. Um, and here's one that um, the messaging service Slack use. Um, it's, you know, Slack, be more productive at work with less effort. Okay, it sounds simple, doesn't it? Be more productive at work with less effort. Working lives simpler, more pleasant and more productive. They're benefit statements. And here's the clincher, <clears throat> the photo at the bottom, a messaging app for teams who put robots on Mars. Now, I'm pretty sure that's going to build some trust in a messaging system if you, you know, if they did that, what couldn't they do? So that's a that's an example of a sort of a consumer facing value proposition. Um, but you, you can develop a value proposition into taglines and into into sales pitches. <clears throat> so Another interesting part of this whole journey is, of course, managing your image and reputation. So 
<clears throat> why we need to know our why, of course, is to be consistent. We don't want to have variable quality, variable responses. We don't want to have angry tones, happy tones, begging tones, pleading tones, all different tones. And so when the big corporates are messaging, they will describe the tone of voice for a particular campaign, okay? Um, it, it might be an authoritative voice if it's a medicinal product, or it, or it could be a joyous voice if it's for a car experience. W whatever it is, that tone should be consistent on that product line to that segment. Even your choice of font should be consistent. Your messaging should be consistent. Uh, be true to yourself and be true to the value proposition. So don't jump around all over the place, changing that value proposition every time you talk to a customer. Use it. And if it's working, keep using it. And if it doesn't work, go back to the drawing board, do, do more research and find out why it's not working and develop it word by word until it does work. There's no shortcut. You know, when these call centres call and use sentences and phrases, they don't vary a full stop, a comma or a word because they've worked out what goes and what doesn't. And that's the same with your, you and your pitch, if you like, to your customers. <clears throat> so promotion. Now, this is a, always a bit of a, I, I wrote down networks, well, we've talked about networks. Um, but importantly, I suppose, what I want to really sort of get to here is that right now, everybody's, you know, the, today's generations look at promotion as simply about social media and digital marketing. But the important point, it, it's not about ageism here, but you know, maybe, that's, maybe that is a good answer, but sometimes it's not a good answer, okay? And that's why the research you do is critical to find out where your customers are, where, where are they being influenced from? Is it LinkedIn? Is it from a industrial company magazine? Is it from some membership base that, that um, looks after their, their specific service sector. Find out where that is. Um, now, obviously, we know um, digital marketing budgets have been growing just you know, endlessly, but you all know, and I know, that there is so much money wasted on digital marketing. It's criminal. And Google is laughing all the way to the bank right now. I pick up my mobile phone. We bought a trampoline a week ago for the kids, right? Because, you know, what else can you do? They're driving us crazy, right? And we made a decision within a day. And ever since then, ever since then, every screen I open has pictures of trampolines down the left margin, the right margin, on my phone, on my iPad, on my laptop. Wherever I go, I've got pictures of trampolines. Now, I'm even closing the ads to see if that changes behavior. No. So these poor people have been paying for these banner ads for me. And I've already made a decision two weeks ago and bought it and it's installed, built, I built it, right? So, you know, I kind of think that that's, um, you know, just a little bit of personal evidence, but you all know the stories of people wasting money and a lot of it, you know, pay per click is just a giant rip off. So, Look, the important thing is I'm not criticising social media or digital marketing. Everything has its place, but it is one channel to market. It is not the channel to market. So look at, look at where your customers are. Understand where they find out what's good. It could just be that their only source of decision making is through personal reference, right? And if that's the case, then build your networks and start putting the message out through your networks. Um, the rest you can read in your own good time. <clears throat> um, yeah, the importance of video. Well, I think you all know that now. Here we are. Look at this one video tonight. So, you know, 80% will watch your video. Um, um, I think, you know, the interesting thing now, of course, is video with text is, is critically important because people are, you know, or well, they were anyway on a train or on a bus. But anyway, they might be in the kitchen, they might be at work and they just don't want anyone else to know what they're looking at. 
they might not have their uh, earpods in. So, yep, text is, is a good idea. And for the moment, that's the trend. So let's go with that. Um, it's interesting, I suppose, that India has a lot of Facebook users, but I'm not sure what we'll do with that piece of information. Now, more scary, I think going to Paula's point here, is the average business professional is sending and receiving 121 emails a day. Well, you know, in my experience, you'd be lucky if one or two of those 121 were any good. Somebody's not on mute, but um, I'm not sure who that is. <laughs> and I won't worry about finding out, but somebody's not on mute. Um, okay, now I'm going to find out. <laughs> We're going to expose them. <laughs> no, I don't know who it is. Okay, so, um, all right, so where do, so, you know, part of the journey, I guess, here is really just discovering. See, no, no, well, we know they speak Spanish. Do you want to have a look down the list, Paula, while I catch up in my notes? I've gone back and forth on the list and I couldn't find for me to show uh, up everybody on uh, mute. It's all right. Don't yeah. worry. It's all good. Um, so, it yeah. Says, it says the... iPhone. Whose? Not mine. No, you just look for the right. iPhone user and that's the one they oh, yeah. send. No, I know. The, good, the, man. I'm just we live with the free one there. The that's, okay. that's all right. We'll keep going. So, you know, the simple message with, uh, with anything on, you know, is, is where do your customers go? Uh, what do they do? How do they purchase? And how do I find this out? Well, you know, you don't have to try and do it all yourself. You can engage some experts. I see Alejandro Catalan's online. If it's the Alejandro I know, he could help you. There's lots of people who can, um, um, you know, help you determine whether you should have, a, you know, an email marketing campaign and mobile ads. Uh, video advertising, any of those many digital choices that, that are relevant and good for you and your customers. But please, before you embark on anything in the digital space, make sure that your money is well spent. There's a lot of choices and we all know, we've seen this diagram in a bigger version that's got a couple of hundred different icons on it. And, uh, you know, we can all just get easily lost in all that space rather than focusing on, you know, where our customers are and what they're doing, what they want. Um, and so the only point I think I was going to make with this thing is here, you know, is regardless of what channel you choose, you know, make sure you're making a good gross margin just to finish this marketing sort of section here. Um, a lot of people focus on customer benefits. They're focused on messaging, value propositions, all that stuff. But remember the first slide, why are we in this? We're in this to make some money. <clears throat> Can, you know, we're not, trying to um, be uh, unfair or unjust or anything, just a reasonable profit. Now, a reasonable gross margin, <clears throat> not an excessive one, is a gross margin is 40%. Now, I talk to a lot of people who do not measure their own gross margin. Now, you should be measuring gross margin by product, not just for the business, okay? So I'll leave you with that. So I think the last slide was just some digital marketing trends, <clears throat> which, you know, it, I guess the um, searches by, by voice, yeah, possibly if we're working from home, there could be more of that. I'm not so sure in the office if that'll work. Um, Siri, not sure, comes and goes in popularity, but I guess it's come off a small base. <clears throat> um, Anyway, voice activated devices, and we all know they're essential, aren't they? We've got them now in the car and everywhere else and, and security systems and all, all that kind of stuff. And customer experiences, of course, are just more and more and more either being measured or being delivered through some kind of digital channel. Everything's changing and it's changing fast. Um, but don't imagine for one minute that this is just an open field and you can just do whatever you like or that you need to be everywhere. You don't need to be everywhere. You just need to be where your customers are or where they want you. So Paula, let's maybe I'll have a break for a sec and let's see what questions we've got. Yeah. Uh, what I really liked that you were speaking about, so turn of voice, I watched this documentary the other day and was talking about um, this presidential election in the United States. And there was this president that was very short 
and he wasn't getting enough momentum because because he was short, people were seeing him as little with no power. So this marketing agency came and built this whole campaign about talking about how strong he was, how strong he was, a strong candidate. And then they started seeing that within a few weeks, everybody's just like, oh, I'm considering voting. for him because he's very strong so you can once you're going you're communicating you can build the tone for tone of voice and people will start repeating it back it's really interesting it's yeah. very 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 powerful we had one question i think someone wait one second it was a few questions behind but i think they wanted you to have a crystal ball for the answer to this <laughs> i agree to move on from the virus um, what about the long-term economic situations we are looming <laughs> so what yeah. are your suggestions okay. Look, crystal ball moment, Chris. No, that's the easiest question oh, I've had all night. You know why it's easy? Because unless you're unless you're looking for world dominance, what the hell does it matter? Yeah. I mean, what do you want? One percent, point two of a percent of an Australian market will make you a rich person. Yeah. You see, it's not about the virus. It's got nothing to do with it. Yeah. There's lots of people. If you're running or starting a small business. It doesn't matter, right? You only need a few thousand customers. That's all you need. If you're Apple, you've got big problems. Yeah. If you're General Motors, you've got bloody big problems. Yeah. But, you know, most of us aren't. We're just looking to find a way to make a living and have a pleasant, happy, simple, successful life. So that's what you've got to focus on. Not worry about competitors, not worry about <clears throat> medical emergencies. Just focus on what it is you want to do that you enjoy, and that you're good at, and that people still need. Yeah. What I'm loving about the stage, because um, we've had a lot of new students starting about two months ago, and all of them were fresh. And I'm loving because now they're coming in with all these great business ideas. And everybody's starting from the beginning. I've spoke this morning, I spoke to a lot of my friends in LA and Silicon Valley and they're all calling me and they're just going, I don't know what to do. And these are like massive serial entrepreneurs that have gone through mergers and acquisitions and everybody's just like, everybody's starting from scratch. So it's a great yeah. opportunity for anyone that's yeah. got the why to compete against, you can even yeah. compete with the big players because the big players yeah. also have lost the foundation. So it's well, the, perfect the more, timing. Look, the more experienced we are, the more stuck in our founded ways we are and that's just a reality of life because you know i've got 50 years of embedded in a certain way of doing things in a certain order world order okay it just got tipped upside down lucky for me i love adapting now young people coming into this new world don't have to worry about what was they only have to worry what is yeah. right so focus on the things that you enjoy doing focus on the things that you're good at and work out where customers still are. What are they buying, right? What are their, their needs? Some of their needs just changed. A whole lot of stuff is now getting delivered to the door, delivered online, delivered in different ways. Um, you know, you can't buy any weights, trampolines. Um, you know, there's just so much stuff at Bunnings and, and, and the sports stores uh, that's just gone in days because suddenly the whole world needed something that none of us thought of okay and so, so many things they sell papers. out no one's buying them now like yeah. i went past some shops and i'm like i don't need that i don't need that i don't need any of that because there's not like like i used to buy a lot of clothes to go on stage and now it's just like yeah. can i have comfy pajamas yeah well this all is you need is a top vest you don't need anything like <laughs> yoga yeah. pants and uh, marco has a really interesting question in regard is exactly on the topic we're talking about so marco's is incredible entrepreneur He's got 200 amazing influencers within his network and he markets them online. And of course we were taking, like he was working on bringing them from the online world to the offline, but now he needs to pivot his business and maybe keep it all online for a while. So his question is, um, if we can create an online um, business that produces concerts or webinars, definitely, we knew it was gonna happen a few years ago already. Is it important to have headliners to charge customers for money? Okay, so let's go back to the value proposition question, right? People will pay for the value that you deliver for the problem that they want solved. So there's an equation here. It isn't a one-sided equation. 
It isn't a question of cost or price. It isn't just a question of value. It's a question of where do those things meet? Where do they intersect? Now, if you're competing with high quality uh, free platforms, that will be a challenge. But somewhere in there, presumably will be a place where you could build such a platform where you could extract some money because none of these platforms that I'm aware of, the popular ones anyway, are free per se. You know, the corporations all pay a subscription fee. But the question is, you know, what's going to be different about your platform and, and what would you expect your clients to pay for some new service experience? And what experience will that be? And will the clients want that experience? So, you know, there isn't, there isn't an answer about what price or should it be free or shouldn't it be free. I mean, what do you want? <laughs> if you want to charge people, then find out, you know, what the price sensitivity is of that particular service and what value people want from it. What are they prepared to pay for? There are I some things the sponsors that, as well, the sponsors, because if you can drive potential <laughs> customers to the sponsors, that would really work. I attended a really interesting workshop the other day and was talking not just about the value, but also how are you transforming your customers' lives? Because often, like, especially, yeah. I see that a lot with first-time entrepreneurs. They go, they yeah. think they need to go for free or the cheapest to get people. But it's just like, if you can show that you're transforming someone's life, because if someone can solve a problem that normally would spend 10 hours, I'm happy to pay a lot more if I can get solved in a minute because my time is worth money and you transform me, helping me go from A to B faster. So I think the yeah. word transformation, especially at a time mm -hmm. like now that everything's transforming so fast, is a big word. Like how can you transform the entertainment experience online? Because people still have money and people still want to be entertained. And maybe yeah. it's more comfortable that you make your own popcorn and you've got your own stereo in your own pajamas instead of having to travel for two hours to go to a concert and line up? Well, well, that's that's a data point of one. <laughs> Paolo Mills data point, okay? Now, if you can replicate that 200 times yeah. and get the same answer each time to the same question, yeah. then you're starting to build a business case. But again, this is the whole intuition thing, you see. We've all got ideas. They come at our head, you know, 100 times a day and... You know, I can remember as a kid, I invented the push button phone, right? So um, we've all had good ideas. Trouble is usually someone else has got there first. Yeah. So the key to this is simply doing market research and testing and not relying on your intuition to build a business. That's a very bad place to start from. It's a good place to sort of generate new ideas from, but then from there, you must go into validation stage, you know, ideation. Uh, validation and it's only that you need to keep on doing forever because you continuously need to validate because consumers behaviors will change as well. well well we'll come to that yeah we'll come to that in a minute there's That's a question good. from ash Yim. what's your opinion on initial revenue producing businesses versus data and human behavior collection business which in the end turns to advertising in their end goals so initial it may be a market grab initially for long-term goals or oh. long-term end goals just we lost, we, we lost you for a minute there Paolo. i don't know if anyone else lost mm -hmm. you as well but um, maybe if ash can because there's a question here that's a very long question but it's got it's not structured yeah, um, you know, look, can hi, hi christopher how are you um, i'm my, good i'm good my question was around what's your opinion on you know, you talked about obviously gross 40%. So those revenue producing businesses and obviously some businesses take time to produce that revenue. Of course, What's your yes. opinion um, in, um, you know, companies where they're looking at the human behavior or data, which in turn replicates to an advertising channel, kind of like your trampoline. So if a business is starting up and initially there's a good value proposition, but the actual cost of the product isn't really a cost because later down the track it will accumulate that revenue but you need that land grab first what's your opinion on that and how you facilitate something like that from your experience look i think you need to be really careful with those kind of loose models of you know hey don't worry we'll get it back later stuff 
you know, customers, if they're buying something that's of value to them, don't expect stuff to be heavily discounted or free. They're just looking for value. But again, remember there are segments of markets, you know, not everyone buys the same way or for the same reason. People buy on a different sets of values. So, you know, you'd have to tell me what market you're in, what, what's the profile of the market you're selling to before I could answer that question. But, I, but as a general comment, I'm not very well disposed to things that don't, you know, create reasonable value in the short term. It, it doesn't really, it doesn't kind of, I don't think it gels well with me from a business principle point of view just to be heavily discounting stuff. Now, if you were doing it to just uh, get some initial sales and you already have a business up and running and this was just a way of putting some product into the marketplace to get it trialed, well, if it had a real hard boundary around it and that boundary was well-defined and the trial was well um, orchestrated, in other words, the conditions of that product trial were well written, um, well described, I could support it. But as a general rule, I don't like the idea of just giving value away. I don't, just the only person who wins there is the person who got it, you know. So, so sorry, to add on to that, so let's say, let's look at a business model like a Uber or a Airbnb, for example, right? They're an aggregation model where they only accumulate once obviously people transact as such, right? So initially they're gonna to have to go for that land grab, right? Because if they don't have, let's say properties on the platform, they can't gain consumers. So what's your opinion on that then in that, that regard? Well, I think that that's a complex one because you've got so many legal, different legal frameworks at play there with all the different regulations for taxis in each state, right? Massive legal war. But the one thing I will say about Uber is um, they've lost the plot in terms of e equity and value, right? There can't just be one winner. There can't just be a winner, which is Mr. Uber or the consumer. The guy in the middle who joined Uber based on the trust and faith and, and everything that he or she was told would happen to them if they joined Uber and drove cars branded Uber is not happening. They're all now desperately unhappy, not making any money. And sooner or later, that's gonna reflect very poorly on, on Uber and eventually therefore on their whole business model. So something has to give. But um, going back to your, you know, your core question, I still think, you know, if you were to take say one, one state, say New South Wales, because uh, Victoria got particularly antagonistic, there was a whole lot of friction there. But if you just take New South Wales, where the poor old taxi drivers, you know, if, if you like, who knew nothing else in life, they all just got shafted. And, and that left the Uber drivers in a position of power. I suppose you could say it worked, but I don't recall getting any great discounts as a user. I had a better experience and so, um, oh, actually, you know, I did have the Uber value proposition. I won't try and uh, bring it up now, but I, I, I actually chose the, um, the wrong value proposition. I could have thrown the Uber one in. I had that handy as well for tonight. Um, and I suppose it, it is a value proposition that's focused heavily on the consumer, and that's good. But right now, I'd say there's a missing voice in that value proposition, and that's the guy in the middle, the driver. And I don't think it's a sustainable model at the moment. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. Yeah, I think what's really hard about the Uber and the Airbnb model, because I've got some, some of my mentors have businesses where it's got those two sides and it's very hard because it's kind of like the chicken and the egg. Mm, you have to spend yeah. like 10 times more money on marketing. Yeah. And then you have to discount because there's so many competitors that come here. I remember when Uber was doing like free, like, I don't know, limo and lamborghini rides with the gel like with a messina ice cream to try to compete because it was so hard to make sure that every suburb had enough people ordering it but also booking it so it's very very everyone thinks that it's a very easy business model because they had no cars and no houses to start uber and airbnb but actually they had to do like 10 times yeah. more marketing because they had to build yes. like a community and marketplace for both of them 
and then build the algorithm and then I make sure that everybody's safe. It's very hard. Um, yeah. Ash, if you want, I've just finished reading the um, Airbnb book. So if you feel like driving up to the Northern Beaches, it's in my mom's house. Perfect. Thanks, <laughs> Awesome book, by the way. That, that will be illegal, by the way. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's, I'll post it to you. Let's move on to sales. Um, so we won't spend too much time here, but look, the, the point I think here, which is really important, is that you do need to be able to sell. And sales is a process, right? Uh, it, it needs to be a very structured process. It isn't it's like the value proposition. It isn't random, okay? It isn't that you say one thing to this guy today and another thing to someone else tomorrow. I'm sure most of you, many of you will have been to America and heard good sales pitches. My gosh, they are so impressive, right? Because sales is such a valued profession over there. It's not so valued here. But you'll know from that experience, if you've had it, how good some of those people are at selling. But Probably more importantly, assuming you do follow a process and you do stick to the value proposition and you do stick to a developed pitch and don't just randomly swap and change things every time you go and see someone, that you will know how your customers are feeling about the product you're selling and the service they're getting. Um, you know, how satisfied are your customers and then how do you know, you know? Um, Influence them, don't hard sell. This is, I think, probably one of those real lessons that you get in life when, you, when you're young, you sort of try and hard sell people. Well, I think the next, the current generation of people are probably more on the side of influencing rather than hard selling, which is good. It's more collaborative, which, which I like. I think that's, um, I don't think people will anymore are buying the hard sell. I think they're resisting that for all it's worth. I think if all those days are gone, and most importantly, please don't focus on product attributes, focus on customer benefit statements. There's probably nothing more important I can say about sales than focus on customer benefit statements. And if you don't know what they are, then it means you need to do some research to find out. Um, yeah, and of course it's complex, isn't it? You know, our customers are not all the same, but you're gonna to have to do some segmentation to work out what groups people belong to right? There are going to be big customers, small customers, people that like to talk all day, people that don't want to talk at all, people that are happy to go digital, people that don't want to go digital. And you've just got to work out and be quite firm. There's nothing wrong with saying, I'm sorry, we don't do that this way anymore. We do it this way. Okay. If that's what your business has decided, then stick with that. Okay. Unless there's some really compelling reason not to, then it's not offensive. You know, we've got a local coffee shop, got the whole virus thing going on. And I noticed that people weren't respecting the one and a half metres. They were walking right up to a counter. So I went and got a whole bunch of chairs and I put them in front of a counter, right? Right around the whole corner. And she looked at me and I said, don't be afraid. People, people understand it. You just have to remind them. And ever since then, the chairs have been there and she hasn't had a single complaint. So you can set service standards, you can set the way you do business, you're in charge, don't be afraid to do it, just make sure that it's what your customers expect. <clears throat> Competition. Look, competitors get in the way of everything, don't they? They can really put, spoil a good story. The key piece of advice with competitors is, is not to be too worried about them. Everybody's got competitors, they're all over the place. The reason you won't have to worry too much about your competitors is because you will be doing the market research that says that the service and quality standards you're delivering for the price you've set is what your customers want from you and they're happy with the relationships that they've built with you. If you are doing that, you don't have to even look over the fence to see what the competitors are doing because your customers will stay with you. They won't leave and go somewhere else. Now, from time to time, you'll scan the environment, doing your strategy plan and say, hey guys, what's going on over the fence? Are people developing products we don't have, providing services we haven't thought of? <clears throat> That's okay, do that scanning, but don't get into that terrible business of, hey, 
Joe dropped a dollar fifty on those tiles yesterday. We need to drop a dollar eighty. Okay, that means you've lost the plot on your value proposition, your service levels, or your product quality. <clears throat> so key takeouts on on that whole little sales piece. You know, research customers, planning, trialing, executing, reviewing. Uh, the review bit's critical, by the way, and it's particularly critical with the digital piece. Um, I know um, Paola knows uh, Crimson Digital Marketing, run by um, a good friend of um, the Academy. And, you know, she said, really, you're just setting a science experiment with that, with some parameters, and you're going to have to test and see if it worked. And if it doesn't work, you need to change something. But don't change everything. <laughs> Just change one thing and keep control of the experiment. Um, yeah, obviously using research, you can, everybody knows you can Google yourself and Google competitors. Um, I don't know, are there any questions on sales? Um, it's a, you know, I think it's often given short change here in Australia compared to marketing, but it is a critical I think in case. regards to understanding your competitors and customers and Lost you again. Hello. Can you Repeat. hear me? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I think, I think um, customers want to be heard more than ever. That's at least like the experience that I see that I have is happening at least in our community. And as soon as you listen to a customer and he feels valued and then he sees that you've changed a little bit based on the feedback and maybe you're not able to change 100% because you might not have the resources or the technology, you build trust and loyalty with customers. Yep. So it's very good to have the relationship and just picking up a phone. I've got some friends that are very big entrepreneurs and they literally call random customers. Like they set some minutes on the week just to call random customers and get valuable feedback. And sometimes they call as the founder and some other times they just call as the call center. And customers love hearing that they get, they're getting voice heard, voice heard and then they've been asked for questions because they feel like they become part of your like family as a business. So I think Absolutely. that works really Absolutely. well. Yeah, yeah and depending it's free on your business you to model, pick up the yeah. call, phone and call them. Yeah, look, depending on your business model, assuming that you've got some personal face to the business as distinct from a, a remote position um, we call it voice of the customer and it's a, such an important occasion and it should be structured it should be professional yeah. and whatever you do don't forget to follow up and if customers say something and you say you're going to do something about something make sure you do and make sure you go back to them and confirm in writing that you know email telephone doesn't really matter I guess but you know, make sure they hear from you that you actually listen to them, you took action, and here's the outcome. So important. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, and writing is yep. always important. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So said here, um, he's asking. You mentioned forty percent gross margin is good. What would be the right profit margin? <laughs> well, that is that is really your profit margin. That is your profit margin. Yeah, we I prefer to. T t talk in terms of gross margin because it's it's you know it's revenue over costs and so you know um, you know if depreciation and everything else is built into it it doesn't talk about specifically about cash flow well that's a, we'll come to that in a second but you know just just use the gross margin calculation which you know I'll just make sure I didn't mislead anyone with the, with the formula but it's simply um, Gross margin is your gross profit, which is the revenue minus your cost, divided by revenue, expressed as a percentage. You know, and if you're so making forty percent, the government has a calculator. You can type it in the calculator for you. Well, it takes two seconds if you know yeah. what your revenue is and you know what your cost is. You just take one from the other and divide it by your revenue, and express it as a percentage. And you know. Uh, the, when I worked for that business where we had, you know, I ran six small, well, they weren't all small businesses. One was about 30 million across seven countries. The first question, the first question the owner would ask when I went into each board meeting as managing director, and we had seven board meetings, was what's the gross margin? That was the first question. 
-hmm. wasn't the second question or the third question. It was the first question because they knew that if gross margin was at 10 or 15%, we were losing money straight mm -hmm. up. They didn't have to go any further. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a real, it's a really good indicator. Trust me. Mm. There's a question from Rishesh. I don't know if Rishesh wants to participate. And it goes, um, what do you think are a few ways of effective industrial B2B marketing? Okay. Well, this is my whole life story here, of course. <laughs> um, look, let's just uh, stay at the top line on this one. B2B marketing is, is, is relationships and trust. It's, it's actually the... the probably the easiest marketing you'll and selling you'll ever do all you have to do is build trust and build value build relationships build networks and you can do anything it's, it's no more complicated than that i love b2b marketing because you it, it's it's personal it's real and you've got a chance to actually build a relationship at a personal level and it's long term and it can be, should be long term, providing you do what you said, Paula, and that is, you know, you talk to your customers, you, you build that platform where they feel they can call you if they're not happy, or they can ring you and say, I loved what you did the other day, or don't ever change that internal salesperson because she always does everything that I want and we love her. So there's so many, you know. One of the most valuable people that we ever had in Blue Scope in Victoria 100 years ago, now it doesn't matter, the story's still relevant, was our receptionist. It's not the people came to reception, it's just that she answered the phone and put the call through to whoever. And my gosh, she had every major customer wrapped around her finger. And she was so good. She was like the rock of the business. Wow. And that was, I mean, how simple is that? You find the right person who loves her job and, and she's good at what she does and you know, she's worth her weight in gold or he doesn't matter. But in this case, it was a her. And, you know, she's remained a friend of mine for, you know, 30 years. And it's a good thing with people that love what they do, they naturally become good at the job and everybody grows together. Yeah, but I think yeah, it's also yeah. about you being aligned to the value of the company that you're applying for a job in. A lot of people come to like, how do I get a job? I'm like, if you don't, yeah. if you don't yeah. love the mission, vision and value, if you don't have the skills, you don't love your job, if you don't jump out of bed and show up to work with a smile, yeah. your job is under threat, especially now. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, exactly right. And, and for B2B marketing, in a, in a way, never been more important to build trust, build relationships, hang on to your customers, service the hell out of them, quite frankly. All right, so managing money. It's, it's simple, isn't it? Money coming in, money going out. Now, if anyone's ever done cash flow forecasting, they'll know it is full of surprises, and I'll be the first to admit it. My biggest learning curve was running those six small businesses. Um, well, actually, we had a, yeah, there was a couple of different balance sheets, but we had to do cash flow forecasting, and... I can assure you that there's a surprise in every month, but it has to be done because if you're not doing it, you'll be, it's hard enough when you are doing it. And if you're not doing it, I'd say it's almost impossible to understand um, your business and understand whether it's going to be a tax office surprise, a superannuation problem, a payroll tax problem, or just a, an inability to pay a supplier on time because at the end of the day, your business reputation is as good as how you treat not just your customers, but also your suppliers. You must protect them and look after them because they will then look after you. And that in turn will foster a, a great business. So managing money, super important. And make sure that you are keeping your money for the tax office and for superannuation and payroll tax and not giving it away because you thought it was just sitting there in the bank account doing nothing don't give it away in discounts <laughs> okay any anything anybody want to add anything on managing money how many people are doing cash flow forecasts anybody uh, it's it's not that easy but you should be doing it even even a rough go at it's better than no go you need to be looking ahead three months yeah 
Who's going to pay you? Hey, so I was doing I was doing a finance class the other day. I was doing some research for a quick boot camp that we were running. And then we were looking at a calculator, like you forecast your best case scenario, your worst case scenario, you calculate in the middle. And then yep. the calculator that was going around like Google was 85%. Once you organize like your average, 85% will pay on time. How do we calculate this? What do you bring it down? Because I've been calculating, literally right now I'm calculating down to 40% when I'm looking at students' businesses. I'm like, let's forecast 40%. Is that Good. more accurate? Yep. Okay. Yep. Awesome. Uh, look, here's the two parts of that question not thinking about students, thinking about customers. Um, the people the people that pay you best are the ones that get the most attention first. It's a really simple process with debtors. You must be giving them a lot of attention or you will be the last to be paid. The people who make the most noise get paid first. It's a really simple principle with debtors. You do not say, I can't ring them, they're a customer. I'm sorry, that's just BS. You've got to get onto that straight away. Anyone that owes you money gets a phone call. It doesn't have to be a rude phone call. It's just a phone call. You know, it's part of building relationships, it's part of understanding what the customer's problem is. And if you agree that they're going to pay you 30 days late, then you just change the terms of payment for that particular invoice. But it's better that you do that than do nothing and just hope that they're going to pay you. It can't be like that. It's a tough, it's a tough part of business, but you've got to be all over that. If you don't make a noise, you won't get paid. I promise you. And forecasting, you know, debtors isn't, isn't easy. Um, you know, you're going to get people who are residual um, late payers and there'll be people that do what they call credit shopping where particularly in B2B, where they'll buy from you, use all their credit, then go to number two, use all their credit, then go to number three, use all the credit. And, you know, if you're not on that pretty quickly, you'll find yourself um, at the wrong end of uh, any payment protection plan that might go in, in place. Um, yeah, that's probably all we need to talk about in terms of money, but it's not a bad thing, but managing cash flow is, is critical and having cash flow forecasts. Don't want to talk too much about managing people yeah, because most of you won't have too many people working for you. The only thing I'd say is if you have to fire someone, it's usually evidence of a poor recruiting process. In my experience, there's not too many people I've had to get rid of that I'd say were bad people. It's rarely the case. Normally, they're just they're good people. They might have found themselves in the wrong position or not suited to the business that you're running, not interested perhaps even. Um, so, um, you know, focus, focus, put a lot of energy into recruiting the right people with the right values, right? Look for evidence that people's values are aligned to yours, how you want them to work, why they want to work, how motivated they are. And then obviously you need to follow a process if you're exiting, if you're hiring. Um, and just a plug for the, um, Business Australia, the old Chamber of Commerce, is now rebranded as Business Australia. Membership is free for a basic level of service. You can just go online and get free membership now. And you can get all sorts of templates for hiring and firing. You know, it doesn't cost you anything. So get hold of that if you need it. Uh, managing quality, well, it's a bit like the sales thing. There's a process, right? It can't vary each time. And if you've got a, let's say you're selling a service, well, set the quality standard, check the quality standard and correct it if it's not working or it's not consistently good. Um, it isn't random. It must be managed. Um, well, we've talked about client service. I don't think we need to talk too much more about service. That was probably a bit out of, out of, um, out of order, that slide. The customer experience, of course, is made up of a whole different range of experiences and, and, and touch points, isn't it? They can have a good experience at, uh, you know, talking to the salespeople and have a bad experience with a call centre. Marketing probably specifically are not interfacing, unless they're in B2B, too much with the customer. But nevertheless, they're influencing every interaction with the customer. Um, but, you know, the customer experience, the point of that slide is customer experience is made up of a whole lot of different uh, touch points. 
and each of them have got to work towards meeting the value proposition. You notice I didn't say exceeding because it isn't about exceeding, it's just about meeting. Um, adapt or die. Wait, the sorry, one thing, Chris, I think one thing that's very important as well, I've seen a lot of people like over promising, hoping to over deliver, but then they realize that they don't have the money to actually offer that service. So one thing that we need to take consideration when we're building our business is it's not just about getting the product to the customer, it's having enough people in the call center to answer. And I've been saying that now, like literally every call center that I've had to call in the last two weeks, like two hours you leave the phone on and no one's answering. And there's nothing Correct. more annoying than that. Correct. Correct. We're all being able to have the finances to yeah. keep servicing your customers. Yes, it's a, it's a really good um, it's a really good segue into into that whole service piece. Over promising just means you're not you're not promising in line with your value proposition, right? You just stepped outside that lane and said, "I'm overtaking and going over here," which you had no capability to do. I've seen it happen in big businesses. It's a disaster when people say in the steel world, okay, I'll get your product next week. Well, I'm sorry, it's impossible, physically impossible to get your steel next week because it takes eight weeks to make, <clears throat> okay? So people who make promises that can't be kept end up alienating customers, breaking trust, and then they go looking for competitors to source product from. So don't do that. <laughs> Not unless you've built the capability to do it. <clears throat> the, the adapt or die is really, I mean, gosh, this slide was built before COVID-19, but I mean, here we are right now. Well, if you ever needed to adapt, guys, this is it. <laughs> it's today. So don't muck around. Start adapting. Look at what your customers want, what markets you think there'll be opportunities in, and, and keep adapting. You know, keep looking at the, the new trends. Uh, keep you know, scanning the horizon, as we say in marketing, to make sure that you're remaining relevant. Because the alternative is Kodak, right? Some of you are old enough to remember Kodak, I'm sure, right? They didn't adapt. They decided that the digital revolution wasn't for them. Didn't go too well. Um, okay, so um, here's a little, well, I'm happy to email this to, Paula, who can send it to anyone, but it is our proprietary product, just so everybody knows. It belongs to Silver and Wise, and it just uses the eight, uh, the eight elements of successful business ownership and tests your personal view of where you think you are on the capability rank against strategy, marketing, sales, etc. Right? You know, I'm bloody good at it, or I'm hopeless at it, or I'm in between. You know, red, orange, green. Yeah, green means you're pretty good, don't need any more coaching. If you're red, you need to learn more, get more coaching. So out of that, you can kind of just see where you think you might need to uh, self-improve. Yeah, because we all, we all need to learn. I mean, I went back to uni at 50 years of age and did my master's program. My mother did a PhD at 77 and uh, published a book just when she was nearly 80. She's 94, still going strong. This is Hunter's book, which um, Paula has read, I believe, Generation Experience, um, which is, again, focuses on the, on the eight modules. Don't worry too much about the title because you're really buying Generation Experience's experience, you know what I mean? It's not that you have to be over 40 to read the book. It's relevant to everybody. Can everybody get... Get a copy of it, Chris. Um, Hello, Chris. Yeah, I got you back. Um, Hunter has, uh, who's the author, has has an offer at the moment, which I've sent you the other day, um, where people can email him, and you can get a copy of the book. I, but I need to be careful. I, I don't know whether it's this book will get your marketing cooking, but one of them. No one. It's the okay. one that you sent to yep. me. Yeah. And also get access to one of the online digit, uh, one of his online courses, which is talking about what we've talked about today, yeah. just in a basic sense. There are other programs, other courses that cost more, but he's giving those away free just because of mm -hmm. the, the current environment. He wants to help people. Mm -hmm. um, and I've said to him, look, if it, if you get swamped, just just stop it. But at the moment, it's open. So yeah. the answer is yes. 
Awesome. So guys, that's that's pretty much you know all, all all I've got. You know, there's a there's a bit of a challenge at the end here, which is you know what would you do in the next couple of weeks that will make a difference for your year? What what's that one difficult thing you're going to do that you haven't had the courage, the energy, or the enthusiasm to do for the last six months. And I'm pretty sure it's going to be something around planning because that's a great starting point because with a plan, you can develop actions. Mm -hmm. So Paula, that's pretty much, and of course, if anyone wants to contact me, you know, there I am. Um, you know, it's a free service, free government service. So anyone, um, do you want to tell us more about the government service? Because I don't think everybody's aware of the service. Yeah, sure, sure. It's it's um, it's um, Michaela Cash's department, federal government department, and and they uh, put a tender out, uh, you know, which began in January last year in 19 regions across Australia, which is aimed at helping aspiring entrepreneurs to start a business through coaching and mentoring. Now. It's aimed at help, principally aimed at helping people transition from the old economy to the new economy. But in reality, we're servicing people of all age groups from all, all parts of the state. You know, I've got people from North Sydney out to Penrith, even over the Blue Mountains. So um, I'm happy to try and, you know, guide people regardless, uh, as long as they haven't, if their business is already well established, then they're really not in my, in my camp. But if you're starting a business or you recently started and need some help, I'm there to help you. And how do they book it? So they go online, they get an extra number of hours. What's the process? It's a simple process. You just email me and I'll send a consent form, which you read, uh, sign, scan and email back to me. I'll then send an email uh, and book a telephone conference time with you. And we'll set aside, let's say, an hour for the first one and then... Um, it, it's kind of a program where I don't do the work. <laughs> you can draw on my experience, but I'm going to ask the people that come to me to do some homework and then they can come back if they want to, they don't have to, uh, and say, right, well, I've, I've done, had a go at a plan. Could you have a look at it? Or what do you think of this value proposition? How do I do market research? Um, what do you think of my business idea? There's all sorts of ways and places where we start. What do you think is the biggest mistake people are making right now when they contact you? Like, what is it a specific question? What is it like the most common? Because there's always trends. I feel like every three months I start seeing the same questions or mistakes. Yeah. What are you easy, currently seeing? Easy question. Three things. No market research. No plan. No why. Let's make four and no networks. Mm -hmm. Right. Those four things. If you get those four things right, you've, you're off off to a flying start. What happens if a person doesn't have a network in that industry yet? So they might have a network overseas, or they've yep. developed a new passion in the last three months. Yep. And that's a great business. What's your well, recommendation then, around that? It means you're a hundred percent dependent on good market research, <clears throat> and there's no short because you're at great great risk of it not going well if you've got no knowledge of that market. Let's say you've got all the enthusiasm in the world to be a pilot, but you've never flown a plane. Okay, well, that's that's just not gonna get you anywhere, is it, right? You're gonna to have to somehow buy, buy the experience quickly, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, if someone said to me, <clears throat> well, why don't you go and start a steel business? I could do it in 24 hours. I, I'd know exactly what to do. If someone said, would you go and start a, uh, a medical services business? The first thing I'd do is I'd go and find the person who knows most about medical services that I could afford and I'd get them on board and I'd find out everything they know <laughs> and work out what I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, there's no short circuit. You short circuit. You have to do the market research. And you'd be surprised because there's so many people that are so talented, but they don't have the passion or the communication skills. So if you have the vision, you can bring mm. some incredible talent behind you. Because there's a lot of people that love what they do, but they don't want to be the front of the business. They don't yes. want to be taking yeah. the risk, paying the bill, yeah. being on stage. Yeah. So you can yes. be that. You can be yes. the founder with the best yeah. scientists in the back end. 
Yes, partnerships can work, but please make sure that you know, alignment on values, yeah. right? And, and the why. Alignment on the why is critical. I had a client the other day, a lovely lady. Um, she had no plan. But that's, I'm used to that. And she had two people take all the money. Mm. Two people already, right? I said, well, I guess you don't need me to say it, but you need to stop that right now. You can't give people the keys to the Maserati. Mm. Okay, that just can't happen. You just don't do it, <laughs> right? Mm. And, and it really meant there was, there was a misalignment. You know, mm. the effort hadn't gone in in the beginning because this, you know, this is where the why is critical. If you had that base established and then someone came along and said, hey, can I join you? The first thing you do is go to that why and say, well, does that fit or doesn't it fit? Mm. Yeah. No, definitely. Anyway, I've well, talked a lot. How we're going with time. Okay, we have four minutes. Does anyone have a super big question to finish off today? You can write it or you can turn on your microphone and camera and you can talk as well. Let's see if anyone is writing. Yeah, hour and a half. They've probably done well if they're still there. <laughs> no, it's been amazing. So interesting. I can see here that. We have people asking for um, the book and the handout and Chris helped. There okay. was a few questions prior to, to the book. So if you go back a little bit. Relationship, okay, there's one on trust. So relationships are built on trust. Trust is gained by communication where personal contact means a lot. How would you suggest building new relationships when people are reluctant to meet? We're in, uh, we are new on the market and don't have all mates or too many existing clients. Yeah. And there's one, because they can continue, one second. And there's one thing I notice with the recent events, people tend to fall back on dealing with the mates rather than exploring new opportunities. Yeah. Even when it seems to add value, it makes it harder for us to sell our services now. Very good question. Yeah. yeah. No, they're, 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 both, they're both good observations. And, you know, I'm not being critical of the Latin community. You know, most of the audience probably is Latin, but you know, no, one less than half of us are Latin today, probably around 30%. But for those that are, let me just talk to that for a minute because, mm -hmm. and you know, I've been an expatriate living in another country. So I know I've been in the situation in reverse, but it is important that you step outside your comfort zone and mix in circles and communities that you don't normally mix in. Because if you just keep reaching for the same audience, you know, depending on the business that you want to start, you're really constraining your potential. And, you know, you're not really integrating and finding, finding out what really works and what ticks with the Australian psyche. So that's, that's one little tip. But look, in, in general, the, um, the key, you know, yeah, trust is the cornerstone. There's been lots of academic discussion on trust. Um, and building networks, I think you can build networks in so many different ways. Um, now, it was easier prior to the current period where you could attend workshops. But you know what? I think you've just got to find ways of joining and finding communities that you can participate in and that you can contribute to. That's one thing. The second thing is I always say to people if they've got a fairly unique business idea, when you start cutting your videos for YouTube, you need to position yourself as the subject matter expert for that particular area. If it's about recruitment, if it's about um, providing coaching on horse riding, whatever it is, you know, run your tutorials and, and provide little snippets within your uh, succession of YouTube videos, you might do a, say you do a 15 or 20 minute broadcast, we'll break that down into one minute slots and post those and become the subject matter expert. Now, you're going to have to get your friends, your friends' friends and your friends of friends' friends to circulate that stuff and to spread it. But there's no other, there's no short circuit to all that process. You must start building big networks and every time you meet somebody, connect with them. There must be some place where they are. Now, if it's irrelevant, okay, don't. But, you know, in the business world, when I see people in a suit or whatever and, uh, and I meet them and I've never met them before, I connect with them on LinkedIn. If, if I possibly can, I do. 
Mm. You know, because you just never know the day that I'll say, hey, I remember meeting so-and-so who worked in that area. I need his or her advice on something. Yeah? So and it's when you connect with them digitally, they're forever connected with you. Yes. You don't lose the business cards. Yeah, it's impossible to build a business from a shell. You just can't do it. You, you, you've got to have connections. Yeah. You can't find yourself on the front page of Google search engine. You haven't got enough money for that. So that's not going to work. Yeah. And even like um, Wilson is a friend of ours that joined and he had to leave a little bit early. And he was in the build the business of franchising a few businesses. And it was interesting. People would come to him because he was a general manager. And they'd go to him and be like, but where are my customers? And it's just like, but you bought a franchise. You need to, even if you buy into a franchise, you yeah. still need to yeah. build relationships. You've got to build, yeah, bring your customers. Yeah, you need feedback to find them. And you see like McDonald's, yeah. different cities in different countries have different recipes and flavors and different spices. Like the Philippines, they have chicken on the menu on, with rice. Yeah, build like, your audience. Talk to people. Go to social gatherings when you can. Send flyers to school. Send flyers to, you know, whatever it is. You just... You know, walk the streets, give people brochures, you know, flyers, uh, join communities, build networks, you know. Definitely not. You, there's there's, no, so there's no easy answer to any of that, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, you. I mean, what you've said, a lot of it is like common sense, common sense. When people have to apply it to the business, they completely step. Like out of the eight steps, I think people step, skip seven of them. So well, they get overwhelmed, Paula. They get overwhelmed and they don't know where to start. The research we did with 10,000 people said people don't know where to start. That's why. That's how the book came the Yeah. So start with something. Start with a plan and your why and work from there and, you know, and do some market research and, you know, things will start falling into place. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you so thanks, much. Guys. guys, if everybody can turn on the camera and thank Chris for his time. Thank you, Chris. Amazing. Thank appreciate you it. so much for making the time and yeah. sharing everything with us. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Chris. you Thank you so much. Can we leave this online on Facebook for everybody to watch? Yeah. Yeah? Cool. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Okay, hey, guys, guys, connect with Chris on LinkedIn. Send him a thank you message. Write him a testimonial. <laughs> thanks, guys. See you guys. Have an Easter. Thanks, Chris. Good afternoon. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao. Bye.